Queens. Back in the 1600s, Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia carried on a correspondence with Rene Descartes, who was trying to defend mind-body dualism. And Elizabeth demands, no, how could something immaterial like the soul affect something material like the brain or the body? Descartes was never able to answer that question, and these days, science has gone way beyond that. We know a lot more about what is happening. We can literally see memories being formed. We can see the chemical changes in neurons. So the soul is supposed to also have memories. How do the memories get from the neurons to the soul? We know that brains often have false memories in them. Do the, does the soul in the afterlife carry those false memories, or are they somehow corrected after death? We even know the laws of physics by which the atoms, the electrons, the elementary particles in our brains behave. We know the equations that the electrons that are responsible for, for chemistry obey. And there's no ambiguity in these equations. They could always be wrong. It is always possible to say, well, we just don't know what is going on. That's fine. But what we have is the evidence of every experiment ever done telling us that these equations are correct. To overcome that, we would need very, very strong evidence. Just one experiment telling us how the soul is pushing around the chemicals in our brain, but we don't have that. What science says is that life or consciousness is not a substance like water or air. It is a process like fire. When you put out the flame on a candle, the flame doesn't go anywhere. It simply stops, and that is what happens when we die. So we're faced at the end with two scenarios. One scenario says that everything we think we understand about the behavior of matter and energy is wrong in a way that has somehow escaped notice by every experiment ever done in the history of science. And instead, there are unknown mechanisms that allow information in the brain to be transferred to blobs of spirit energy that persist after we die and can talk to the other blobs of spirit energy, but don't talk to us except sometimes they do. The other scenario says that physics is right and that people under stress sometimes have experiences that are not actually real. On the basis of rationality, it is not a difficult decision to choose between these two options. On the basis of emotion, it might be difficult, but we need to have the courage to live life here in the actual world. Thank you. Thank you, Sean Carroll. What you should be doing over and over again is comparing the predictions or expectations under theism to under naturalism. You find that over and over again, naturalism wins. And I'm going to zoom through these. It's not the individual arguments that are important. It's the accumulated effect. If theism were really true, there's no reason for God to be hard to find. He should be perfectly obvious, whereas in naturalism, you might expect people believe in God, but the evidence to be thin on the ground. Under theism, you'd expect that religious beliefs should be universal. There's no reason for God to give special messages to this or that primitive tribe thousands of years ago. Why not give it to anyone? Whereas under naturalism, you'd expect different religious beliefs inconsistent with, the, with each other to grow up under different local conditions. Under theism, you'd expect religious doctrines to last a long time in a stable way. Under naturalism, you'd expect them to adapt to social conditions. Under theism, you'd expect the moral teachings of religion to be transcendent, progressive, sexism is wrong, slavery is wrong. Under naturalism, you'd expect that they reflect, once again, local mores, sometimes good rules, sometimes not so good. You'd expect the sacred texts under theism to give us interesting information. Tell us about the germ theory of disease. Tell us to wash our hands before we have dinner. Under naturalism, you'd expect that sacred text to be a mishmash, some really good parts, some poetic parts, and some boring parts and mythological parts. Under theism, you'd expect biological forms to be designed. Under naturalism, they would derive from the twists and turns of evolutionary history. Under theism, minds should be independent of bodies. Under naturalism, your personality should change if you're injured, tired, or you haven't had your cup of coffee yet. Under theism, you'd expect that maybe you can explain the problem of evil. God wants us to have free will. But there shouldn't be random suffering in the universe. Life should be essentially just. And at the end of the day, in theism, you basically expect the universe to be perfect. Under naturalism, it should be kind of a mess. This is very strong empirical evidence. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but I can explain all of that. I know you can explain all. So can I. It's not hard to come up with ex post facto justifications for why God would have done it that way. Why is it not hard? Because theism is not well defined. That's what computer scientists call a bug, not a feature. 
Immanuel Kant famously said, there will never be an Isaac Newton for a blade of grass. In other words, sure, you can find some physical explanation for the motion of the planets, but never for something as exquisitely organized and complex as a biological organism. Except, of course, that Charles Darwin then went and did exactly that. We can paraphrase Dr. Craig's message as saying, there will never be an Isaac Newton for the cosmos. But everything we know about the history of science and the current state of physics says we should be much more optimistic than that. Thank you. But the problem is, this movie is full of nonsense. The movie tries to get across the message that what quantum mechanics teaches us is that we can change the nature of physical reality by thinking about it. That by putting ourselves in the right mental state, we can make the real world what we want it to be. Look, when you're trying to understand the world, there are two approaches you can have. One kind of approach is that when you try to look at the world, you come with a precondition. You come with a set of demands that the world tell a story that is flattering to you. The other thing you could do is to come with an authentically open mind and open heart and expend many different hypotheses and compare them to the evidence and accept what the evidence tells you, discard the hypotheses that don't fit the evidence and believe in the hypotheses that do. And that second method is called science. And I would like to say, <laughs> that it's more than that. That second method is called honesty. And it probably is a good method to use in all sorts of fields of human endeavor. <laughs> science is one of them, but there are probably others that you can also think of. So in the end, however, I think nevertheless, despite the fact that we're good scientists, the universe has managed to tell us a flattering story about ourselves. Here is the Hubble Deep Field with all those galaxies. This little insert is an image of the Earth as seen from the Voyager satellite as it was leaving the solar system in February 1990. There we are, a pale blue dot that is an insignificant little piece of this wide universe, most of which is completely invisible to us. Nevertheless, despite the fact that we are this tiny little piece, in this very, very vast cosmos. Over just a couple hundred years, a few thousand years of thinking and collecting data and dealing with it, we have managed to come to understand a great deal about how this universe is working. We have managed to extend our imaginations and our instruments across the stretches of space and learn a lot about a universe that is a lot bigger than we are. And it's that kind of fact that make, gives me hope that there may be uh, some hope for us in the end after all. Thank you. What does it mean and what is, what is the role played by God as an unmoved mover, as an Aristotelian first cause, uh, God as a necessary being? Very often, if you ask theologians, you know, how would the universe be different if God did not exist? They will say, I cannot imagine a universe in which God does not exist. Therefore, I cannot answer that question. To me, as a scientist, there's a huge problem right from the start with this kind of reasoning, which is that it is the, the whole strategy is one based on some a priori metaphysics. That is to say, this is, you know, very much armchair philosophizing in, uh, you know, in the best sense of the word, sitting down, thinking about all the possible ways the world can be, and concluding that those ways must somehow involve the idea of God. You don't ever, there's no step in that process in which you actually go out and look at how the universe actually is. You don't need to in this way of thinking about it because you can just argue logically that God must be part of the universe. It is my firm belief that this kind of reasoning has never taught us anything true and interesting about the actual world. Uh, that is not to say that armchair thinking without going out and looking at the world is not useful in any way. It's extremely useful. Mathematics, logic, other uh, branches of philosophy and formal inquiry are not empirical in nature. They don't involve going out and looking at the actual world. They, they reason in an a priori sense, but they also don't reveal interesting truths about the actual world. Mathematics reveals consequences of axioms. You say, I have a certain axiomatic uh, structure and I derive theorems on the basis of that. It doesn't tell you which axioms are possibly true. 
If you want to actually figure out our universe, does it involve some notion of God, that is an actual fact about the specific universe in which we live. And I personally don't think this, this a priori kind of reasoning is ever going to uh, get us there. The thing that we learned by doing science for 400 years is something called naturalism. The idea that there is only one reality, that there are not separate planes of the natural and the supernatural, that there is only one material existence and we are part of the universe, we do not stand outside of it in any way. And the way that science got there is through basically realizing that human beings are not that smart. You are not Vulcans, you're not Mr. Spock, you're not perfectly logical. We as human beings are subject to all sorts of biases and cognitive shortcomings. We tend to be wishful thinkers and to see patterns where they're not there and so forth. And in response to this, science developed techniques for giving ourselves reality checks, for not letting us believe things that the evidence does not stand up to. One technique is simply skepticism, which you may have heard of. Scientists are taught that we should be our own theory's harshest critics. Scientists spend all their time trying to disprove their favorite ideas. This is a remarkable way of doing things that is a little bit counterintuitive, but helps us resist the lure of wishful thinking. The other technique is empiricism. We realize that we are not smart enough to get true knowledge about the world just by thinking about it. We have to go out there and look at the world. And what we've done by this for the last 400 years is to realize that human beings are not separate, that the world is one thing, the natural world, and it can be understood. Here is a photograph from the Hubble Space Telescope of a few hundred out of the hundreds of billions of galaxies in our observable universe. The theistic explanation for cosmological fine-tuning asks you to look at this picture and say, I know why it's like that. It's because I was going to be here or we were going to be here. But there is nothing in our experience of the universe that justifies the kind of flattering story we like to tell about ourselves. In fact, I would argue that the failure of theism to explain the fine-tuning of the universe is paradigmatic. It helps understand the other ways in which theism fails to be a better theory than naturalism. What you should be doing over and over again is comparing the predictions or expectations under theism to under naturalism. You find that over and over again, naturalism wins. And I'm going to zoom through these. It's not the individual arguments that are important. It's the accumulated effect. If theism were really true, there's no reason for God to be hard to find. He should be perfectly obvious, whereas in naturalism, you might expect people believe in God, but the evidence to be thin on the ground. Under theism, you'd expect that religious beliefs should be universal. There's no reason for God to give special messages to this or that primitive tribe thousands of years ago. Why not give it to anyone? Whereas under naturalism, you'd expect different religious beliefs inconsistent with, the, with each other to grow up under different local conditions. Under theism, you'd expect religious doctrines to last a long time in a stable way. Under naturalism, you'd expect them to adapt to social conditions. Under theism, you'd expect the moral teachings of religion to be transcendent, progressive, sexism is wrong, slavery is wrong. Under naturalism, you'd expect that they reflect, once again, local mores, sometimes good rules, sometimes not so good. You'd expect the sacred texts under theism to give us interesting information. Tell us about the germ theory of disease. Tell us to wash our hands before we have dinner. Under naturalism, you'd expect that sacred text to be a mishmash, some really good parts, some poetic parts, and some boring parts and mythological parts. Under theism, you'd expect biological forms to be designed. Under naturalism, they would derive from the twists and turns of evolutionary history. Under theism, minds should be independent of bodies. Under naturalism, your personality should change if you're injured, tired, or you haven't had your cup of coffee yet. Under theism, you'd expect that maybe you can explain the problem of evil. God wants us to have free will. But there shouldn't be random suffering in the universe. Life should be essentially just. And at the end of the day, in theism, you basically expect the universe to be perfect. Under naturalism, it should be kind of a mess. This is very strong empirical evidence. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but I can explain all of that. I know you can explain all, so can I. It's not hard to come up with ex post facto justifications for why God would have done it that way. Why is it not hard? Because theism is not well defined. That's what computer scientists call a bug, not a feature. Immanuel Kant famously said, there will never be an Isaac Newton for a blade of grass. In other words, sure, you can find some physical explanation for the motion of the planets, but never for something as exquisitely organized and complex as a biological organism. Except, of course, that Charles Darwin then went and did exactly that. We can paraphrase Dr. Craig's message as saying, there will never be an Isaac Newton for the cosmos. 
but everything we know about the history of science and the current state of physics says we should be much more optimistic than that. Thank you. When you think about everything that happens in the universe as simply materialistic particles obeying their equations of motion, and I strongly think that the answer is yes. And I've seen no evidence whatsoever in anything that Stuart said or anyone else to convince me otherwise. I think what happens is we look at problems that seem really, really difficult and we lose our nerve. We tend to blur the distinction between the infinite and the merely really big. The distinction between the impossible and the kind of difficult. Or the distinction between uh, things that we see all around us happening all the time and things that are actually necessary and could not be otherwise. So because we're faced with these problems that are hard, but nevertheless, we see specific examples of hard problems that get solutions, I would say that we should look at the problems of where does love come from, where does morality come from, how does the biosphere evolve, and say, these are hard problems, let's get to work. Thank you. So here's where we are. The best news is that something is happening. The universe is not just made of the standard model of particle physics. We have absolutely definitive evidence that something beyond either the standard model or general relativity is out there and governing most of the gravitational dynamics of the universe. The dark matter sector certainly exists. There's room to play about what the dark matter is. You could combine dark matter with modified gravity. You cannot get rid of dark matter by modifying gravity. The bullet cluster and other pieces of data speak against that. Dark energy, I cannot be quite as definitive about. I think it exists. The theories that we know run into trouble empirically, but we're just at the start of inventing these theories. On the one hand, it's very hard to out Einstein Einstein. On the other hand, it's a lot of fun, and if you win, then you win big. So it's a high risk, high reward kind of game. The most important lesson is that 95% of the universe is something we've never touched, something we have inferred from its gravitational field, but not ever seen here in the laboratory. We should not be sanguine about the idea that we basically understand it and it's a matter of dotting I's and crossing T's. We should be very open-minded about surprises and keeping probing this regime, both experimentally and theoretically, as hard as we can. Thank you. And I need to add a word of appreciation to this beautiful chapel that we're holding the event in. I just hope that somewhere in the middle of my talking, the roof does not fall on my head. <laughs> but if it does, that would be evidence, and I would update my beliefs accordingly. <laughs> I also want to... Uh, <laughs> That's a great question. So back in the day, again, back in my day, uh, it, was, it was very, very common to imagine that the expansion of the universe was just temporary. At some point, it might be possible, people thought, they weren't dogmatic about it, but they took seriously the idea the universe would expand, stop, and then recontract. Now you notice that in the universe as we observe it today, the universe is getting bigger and the entropy is going up. So you begin to wonder, is that a necessary connection? If the universe began to recollapse, would entropy go down again? The simple way of thinking about things says no. There's no reason for the entropy to start going down again. The universe could continue to become lumpier. There's no reason for it to smooth out. Just because the universe starts contracting does not mean that omelets start turning into eggs. Okay? However, we might not know everything. After all, we do have this weird thing that at the Big Bang the entropy was low. Maybe whatever unknown explanation we need for that fact implies that if there was a big crunch it would also have a low entropy. And in fact, Stephen Hawking wrote a paper where he said exactly that. He said that if the universe begins to recollapse, the entropy will go down again. 